Uh, welcome to the Virtuosity Podcast, and we are uh, doing our John Coltrane audio biography. I'm here with my co-host, Timo Shanko. Hello. Hello, Timo. And uh, we are, we last, uh, we did uh, part one, and, uh, and so we'll get into uh, part two in just a second, but I just want to say a few things first. Um, this is part of a, um, a whole audio biography uh, on John Coltrane, where we dig in and we go through his entire career, really from a musical point of view. And um, uh, as we mentioned in, in part one, uh, there's a great documentary out uh, called Chasing the Train, and we highly recommend anybody interested in Coltrane or starting to learn about him, check out that documentary because it gives you a great overview of his uh, life, but, uh, you know, it's an hour and 40 minutes long, and so it's impossible for them to get deep into the music, so that's why we're doing our series. And Another great resource, Ethan, is uh, Lewis Porter's uh, biography book. That was a really good biography that Lewis Porter wrote. And w- what's the name of that one? Uh, you're putting me on the spot, sorry. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. All right, well, we'll... we'll you know, we'll, it's Lewis Porter's bi- famous biography of Train. That was the best one all right, of, so, of his biography, so for you, sure. So if you Google uh, Lewis Porter and John Coltrane, yeah. you'll get that easily. Okay, great. Yeah, I think he's considered the premier biographer of, of Train, and he does a good job in that book. Great. Um, and uh, so the way this series works is that we're going to make part one and part five available for free to everybody um, so they can get an idea of what we're doing here. Um, but uh, the other parts are all going to be uh, just exclusive content for our Patreon uh, customers and subscribers, I guess I should say. And that's part of the exclusive content that you can only get at, pat- at our Patreon, and that's patreon.com slash virtuosity. And you can go there and... Uh, there's a um, you know subscription for people who are just fans of the music and want to hear um, the audio uh, biographies, uh, and then there's also other tiers where we get into uh, Timo's uh, exclusive transcriptions that he's done of solos that will be for provided uh, based on the cuts <clears throat> that we're playing on the show, um, and not only that, but you get more. Um, we're going to be doing a series of these audio biographies on many artists, mostly focused on jazz because that's Timo's expertise and where he has a lot of the work he's done on the transcriptions. Um, and, but also, there's also classical content. I'll let you ex- quickly explain the the classical content, uh, Timo. Oh, okay. The classical content would be like. Um I put the chord changes on the music, so it would be like Chopin nocturnes with the harmonizations. Because when you read through Chopin, it, the piano music is so difficult to read, and you enter into the world of, uh, of classical piano, you know, put, what you do with your fingers, and uh, it's kind of this ancient uh, high art form of mechan- piano mechanics, and I want to bypass that, because everybody talks about that. I want to bypass that and talk about the actual chord changes, the actual harmony that's being played, how you voice the chords, because that is applicable to your own composing, your own knowledge of harmony, your own arranging and orchestrations, and your own jazz writing or jazz improv playing. It's like that. this is the keys to the kingdom, in my opinion. So I kind of developed a uh, way of writing harmony on the classical scores and piano literature and, and piano reductions of, of scores. Uh, to kind of get right to the meat of the matter. And I'd like to share that with people. Great. Very cool. And uh, and so uh, some of the examples of other people will be doing these audio biographies would be Miles Davis. Uh, give me a few more names of people you're... Ornette Coleman, Thelonious Monk, Art Tatum. We could even do things like uh, great songwriter uh, revolutionaries like Bob Marley or something like, you know, people, John Lennon, I don't know, people along that maybe cross genres that way. Right. Uh, but but that more focused on jazz for my own tastes personally. Yeah. And, and also, transcriptions for sure. Right. I know you've done transcriptions of all sorts of And different- composers. We could do Bartok, Chopin, I don't know, you know, 
Yeah. We could focus in on uh, my favorite composers, too. Right. Uh, but in terms of the transcriptions, most of the, those are like solos um, uh, and yeah. things within the tunes because uh, there's, ac- there's a lot of access to get the, the, um, the sheet music for a lot of this music. But what's unique about your transcriptions is the, is the solo transcriptions that are also in uh, uh, different keys so that guitars... Yeah, the, yeah the, and my, my, my transcriptions are... Um, well, I mean, if I could brag a little bit, they're accurate. Whereas if you buy uh, other people's transcriptions, they're sloppy, inaccurate, in B flat or E flat. So if you play piano or guitar, you're now in a wrong key. It becomes like this impenetrable uh, tangle of wrongness to kind of grapple with. And all the while, what we're trying to do is cut to the chase, cut right and get to the heart of the music and not, you know, all this nonsense that gets kind of surrounded and it uh, makes it impenetrable, you know. Uh, uh, for a lot of people, they, they want to use, um, uh, you know, they want to u- uh, use pictographs of the fretboard instead of reading music. Or, you know, sa- saxophone players all want to play in B-flat, read in B-flat. I want everything in concert key. And I can, you know, some of the stuff is transposed to all the relevant keys, B-flat, E-flat, bass clef, etc. But... Uh, for me, it's about unifying all the music into concert key, where everything's written accurate. Uh, the, the double bar lines are always at the end of the staff, you know, so you can really see the sections, so you can practice sections at a time, so you can memorize the music well. And uh, it kind of gets rid of all the things that are wrong about the real book, you know, the wrong book. You know, just bypass all that and get right to the music. Great. Okay, that's, uh, again, check out the Patreon page if you're interested in any of that material. And if you want uh, the full uh, audio biographies that we're going to be doing on these great artists. Um, So let's, uh, uh, well, I guess one last thing, you can always find us on Spotify. You Also on YouTube, you'll find our playlists and and uh, video when uh, when there's good video of the of the performances we put up the videos there as well so that's really nice. fun uh what to you know to be able to see uh, how how these guys do this instead of just always listening um so that's an advantage we get over there at uh, at youtube um yeah. but let's get into part two uh we last left john coltrane um kind of down and out uh yeah he he uh, really descended into a terrible uh, heroin addiction and miles has has fired him uh, what was that for the second time? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I, I think it was the first time Miles fired him, but it was the third time he got fired from one of his uh, mentors' bands. You know, he got fired from Dizzy's band with a needle hanging out of his arm. He got fired from Johnny Hodge's band being late and sloppy. And now he gets fired from Miles's band for all of the above. Right. You know? And so here's this earnest... A kind of he's a really nice guy and he's a really hard worker he really loves music and practicing and he's a sweetheart of a man and he's getting the gig with who he wants to get the gig with his life's going to open up in front of him but he just can't get the monkey off his back you know the, the addiction thing and it kept, comes to a head with him getting fired by Miles and beat up you know Miles actually punched him out at the gig uh, Thelonious Monk had to come to his rescue is sort of the legendary story. This is kind of shocking stuff, you know? And uh, I think he, he, at this point he was now determined to turn this around. His playing on the recordings is already really good. You know, he's a really excellent bird disciple. He's, his 16th note on double up bebop playing is already like par excellence. You know, he's one of a handful of guys playing it on that level. <clears throat> he's already got that Coltrane beautiful conception of the higher uh, tone on the tenor and so he's already he's already on his way to to being his own man and being the great musician but he just needs to kick the the habit and he goes to philly so just so he was in new york uh, when he was Mm -hmm. fired by miles he goes basically back to his hometown in philly philadelphia right to clean up yeah and he goes through the the horror crucible of 
kicking the habit, which is going to be two full weeks of intense vomiting and diarrhea and cramps everywhere in your body, sweats and chills, and it's it's horrible. And you have to face your demons from all accounts. Like in the movie, they talk about uh, him facing it alone upstairs in the apartment, and um, people just kind of bringing him things every once in a while, a little something to eat or mostly just water to keep it going. And you have to face the horrors. And and all the while, you know, you got the devil right on your shoulder. He's telling you, hey, man, all you got to do is is take some a little more of this the same old shit and all this pain will go away. It really is like a Faustian bargain, you know. It's a He's going to be right there telling you every second, all you got to do is take some more shit and you'll be fine. <laughs> you know, it's terrible. Well, uh, but he was determined to get through it and he did get through it. And... I think he talks about uh, what helped him get through it was his uh, faith in God. And he d- he had a epiphanous moment with the creator, so to speak, I think, at that time. And that's when he composed the poem of gratitude to God and service to the goodness of God. And he composed the poem that would later be in the Love Supreme album jacket that he would then do in plain chant style on Psalm, the fourth part of Love Supreme, is plain chant uh, recitation of the poem on C minor. Wow. And, and that comes from this, this uh, experience. And if you read the poem, it's, you know, all praise to God, gratitude to God. It's just, uh, I, will, I will work for you tirelessly uh, if you get me through this. It's a deal. He's making a bargain, not with the devil. He's making a bargain with God. <laughs> right. And he really holds it up, and he becomes this great symbol uh, to the world, a sort of beacon of light, uh, point of light to the world that is called John Coltrane. And, you know, not just through the hard working, but just the recovery and the, the music has this spiritual dimension that, that goes on fire after this. And uh, yeah, thank God it happened. <laughs> now, what what year was uh, Love Supreme released? I mean, how many years earlier is this? He recorded it like around Christmas time, 64. So this is seven years earlier when he wrote that, that wrote that poem. Yeah, 57. So, yeah. So and, uh, he's starting uh, on that, that, April. that kind of spiritual path or, you know, this awakening and it's going to kind of culminate, um, at least in relationship with this poem and that Kind of well, you know, the so. funny thing about about jazz, uh, in particular, is saxophone practicing. Saxophone practicing kind of puts you in touch with this more like ancient woodwind. The gods of India seem to be invoked through in very earnest woodwind practice. Does that make any sense? <laughs> well, I think you know I, there, one, one thing we hadn't talked about yet. I think is that I think you know, and I think you and I talked about this a while back when I asked you, you know, what it is it. Obviously, you had these, you know, musicians that you that you admired and were learning about and studying, um, you know, from Bird to, to Coltrane and everything. In terms of, you started as a bass player and then and then picked up the sax at a certain point um, because I think, as you said, you wanted to do what they were doing. But but also, yeah, I was so influenced by them, I was moved by their music. Yeah, sure. But also, going from a stringed instrument to a, a an instrument that's controlled by breathing um, mm. and has a vocal quality to it because of that. Um, it really is a, you know, it's a, it's kind of halfway between a pure musical instrument where you tap on things to create sound and where <laughs> you're actually using your physical breath, your life force yeah. to make music yeah. with this instrument. And, yeah, there's the singing on it, and then there's the breathing. That's, it ends up being a kind of meditation. And, uh, you know, if you do four, four or six hours a day of, like, earnest uh, woodwind practice, it seems to kind of take over a meditative state. I mean, I know that a lot of guys are geeky math guys, and they kind of make the whole thing kind of stuck in the mud of math instead of it uh, being more spiritually expansive. But... But for me and, and uh, numerous others, I, I, you can re- readily see and hear the spiritual component to it. And I often feel connectivity to Bismillah Khan from India to invocate the gods of, of the, the ancient Hindu gods. It almost seems like you're in touch with ancient Tibet or 
levitating stones and some ancient technology that built the pyramids. You almost feel like you're, like you're going there with it. It's like that expansive. Wow. <laughs> wow. Um, so I guess as we go along, you'll, you'll point out the milestones of when he started listening to music uh, from India and other places. I don't know if he already was at this point or if that's something that started to develop in, in the upcoming years. But, uh, I mean, he was also... I guess, seeking out and listening to other music uh, um, now other than just, uh, you know, Charlie Parker and Bebop and those kind of things. Well, you know, he tips his hat to Sidney Bechet, uh, the great, you know, uh, pioneer of the soprano sax. And it's readily apparent in, like, Art Blakey's drumming that he's listening to African music and he's listening to Caribbean music that's more readily connected to its African roots than American music is. You know, American music shuffles more and does kind of its own thing with rhythmically as does um, Jamaican music. But the other Caribbean nations, the the population that had been slaves was much closer to their African roots. In Cuba, that's African music, you know? In Haiti, that's African music. Yeah. And um, those guys are checking all that out because they want to get in touch with their African roots for sure. They're they're black nationalists too, you know. They're not, and they're also very intelligent. So it's not like they're not aware of of these uh, basic cultural things. Hmm? Right. Um, so let's get uh, onto the music and. Uh, um, so it's kind of set us up where, so he, he's kind of re, re, uh, recovered from the habit. He's kicked the habit. He's made his deal with God, uh, to service, yeah. uh, you know, love and beauty and, 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 uh, creativity. And, and the so, amazing thing is that he does his first prestige session under his own name. The other albums that were released that are released as Coltrane albums that were recorded before this were not his sessions. They just released him as his sessions because he became more fe- famous than the guys who were uh, were the leaders of the session. But this session on the album called Coltrane, Prestige 7105, uh, with a picture of him kind of like on a park bench or something, kind of staring at you with his tenor laid out in front of him, that's his first actual solo album. Wow. And it happens a month after he's clean. So it's like very appropriate. And it seems like God is already fulfilling his end of the bargain. Like, okay, you made a deal with me. Here's your first solo album. Do it. Um, And so he returns to New York for these, for these sessions. Yeah. Yeah. He's back in New York, but it's just a month later. Right. Okay. Um, And, and um, so on the record, you know, there's a Cal Massey tune. It was his old Philly composer, buddy, trumpet player. And then he does, uh, While My Lady Sleep seems, it, his treatment of it is so original because he's already doing these original arrangement uh, revamps on standard. So you don't even really recognize the standard. Who, who knows what show that's from? While My Lady Sleeps, that's not in the canon of like the American songbook. You know, nobody talks about While My Lady Sleeps. And he does this kind of cool uh vamp in the beginning that's already makes it a uh, it already makes it a train tune you like the way he's going to make my favorite things his own thing it's not that doesn't sound like the rogers and hammerstein musical and uh on this album he's going to do straight street which is an original of his and um that's the kind of tune where there's a uh, complicated uh uh chords complicated, fast-moving chords, you know, lots of two-fives moving around and kind of in an original fashion, which he'll become famous for with giant steps and stuff in a couple of years. And then his penchant for picking standards that people don't play much that are going to become, because he plays them so great, they become standards because Train played them. Time was... And the great ballad, Violets for Your Furs. Nobody else, I don't have a recording of anybody else playing that until Train played it. And then people started playing it because Train played it so good. Cool. All right. So let's listen to uh, While My Lady Sleeps. Um, And it's uh, Coltrane's uh, debut album as a leader. (laughs) 